The 14th head coach in Penn State men's basketball history set to address the public for the first time at the top of the hour. Mitch Gerber alongside the voice of the Nittany Lions, Steve Jones. Steve, obviously a great setting for Penn State today to welcome Coach Shrewsbury officially to Nittany Nation. Well, he better get used to this room. This is the practice floor right here, so he's going to get used to that. This is a great day for him. It's a great day for the program. A day like this is a day of hope. It's a day of optimism, of what can be, and he's going to outline his vision for that. He's a hard worker with a great background, and I think he has a tremendous chance of success here. Having been the voice of Penn State men's basketball for 39 years, coming up on your 40th year, what is the most prominent question you want Coach Shrewsbury to answer today? I think the most prominent question is what his vision is for the program. What kind of player does he want to get in here? Uh, you know, how he wants to run an offense, how he wants to run a defense, and then you start fitting the parts around that. So that will be part of it because we're in an era now that between four-year recruitments, some red shirts, transfers you can build a program you have a chance to do it actually quicker now than ever before he's got the personality the nba background which i think is really important you can walk in and say look i coach you know jalen brown i coach jason tatum well he's done all that and more during the course of his lifetime and already you can tell he's the kind of guy that's just a really good teacher but he also relates in this personable i think his personality is going to come out here today these people are going to walk out of here today saying, wow, they picked a winner. We're going to hear from a couple of prominent figures that uh, know Coach Shrewsbury inside and out from his coverage or from his coaching tenure back at Purdue. Susan, appreciate you tuning in to our press conference show. Greg, let's get it, Coach. Coach will be addressing the media here in just a few moments. And Elena, great to see you this morning as well. Now let's welcome in one of those individuals, Rob Blackman, who is the play-by-play -play voice of Purdue men's basketball. A little connection between he and Steve as we welcome him into our live coverage. Rob, for those that don't know Coach, Coach Shrewsbury, much like we do not know, what is Penn State getting from their new leader? Uh, well, first of all, Mitch and Steve, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about one of my all-time favorite guys and Coach Shrewsbury. Uh, the Penn State fans are, are, are a couple of things they're getting with Coach Shrewsbury. Number one, they're getting a grinder, a guy who's going to work tirelessly to make sure the Penn State basketball rises to the level to which the fans think and want it to be. And I bring that up because, you know, he's one of those guys, uh, one of these guys is literally has come up from the bottom and made his way to the top. You know, at yeah. one point he was a – he, not only was he an assistant at a Division three level school, he also was a head coach at a small school, one of the head coaches that, that had to drive the team van to the games, right? One of those guys. So he wasn't just head coach, had to do a little bit of everything. So he literally has worked his way from the bottom rung and now to the top being a head coach at the Big Ten level. Uh, so you're going to get a grinder in that. The other thing uh, the Penn State fans uh, are going to really enjoy about Coach Shrewsbury, and I think you guys have probably already found this out a little bit, is he's very personable. He's a he's a tough guy not to like, right? He's just one of those very likable people, uh, relates well to recruits, certainly relates well to fans, relates well to the media, to all those involved, not only in that Penn State community, but in the college basketball world. He's just one of those guys, like I said, that's tough to dislike. He's just such a likable guy. Has a great family, his wife Molly and their kids, just a wonderful family. And I, I just think he, you know, from what I know about the Penn State Nittany Lion basketball family, I think he's a great fit uh, for those two reasons, if, if nothing else. He's a grinder and he's a very personable guy, and, and, and the fans are really going to take to him very quickly. There's another important aspect to this too, Rob, and that's what Matt Painter did. He handed him the clipboard. He said, you're my offensive coordinator. What did that mean in his growth as a coach and the confidence that Matt Painter had in him saying, you take it here. You know, for those that maybe have watched a Purdue game in the last two years, or uh, even if it was just as have caught some highlights, if you watch closely, whenever Purdue was on the offensive end of the floor, Coach Painter was in his seat. The coach that was standing up was Coach Shrewsbury. He was running the show. As you said, Steve, he was the offensive coordinator. And you think about not only does he have the opportunity to run an offense uh, at, at the Big Ten level, but, you know, he also brings a lot of those uh, NBA offensive concepts yeah. with him from working with the Boston Celtics. And, and those that follow the NBA would be the first to tell you that offensively, there aren't a whole lot better in the business uh, than Brad Stevens. So he's had a chance to learn under Brad Stevens uh, at both ends of the floor, obviously, but offensively is, is where his forte was the last two years with Purdue. But 
I know I'm being a long, long, long winded here, but to answer your question directly, Steve certainly meant a lot in, in his growth uh, to ultimately becoming a head coach. And think about this. He had a pretty good gig at Boston. I mean, he was the top mm -hmm. assistant for the Celtics. He elected uh, on his own accord to come back to the college game because ultimately his goal was to become a college head coach at the high major division one level. And obviously that uh, risk that he took on himself has paid off because here he is getting introduced today as the head coach of Penn State basketball. Rob, joining us again, he is the play-by-play -play voice for Purdue men's basketball, Rob Blackman. Now, Coach Shrewsbury will address the media right behind us at the top of the hour, 12 o'clock to be specific, as he will meet with the media for the very first time. The NLC donors coming in to fill behind as well as you get a look at one right there. Rob, you mentioned his experience at Boston and his choice to come back to Purdue. Why did he do that? Well, kind of what I was alluding, alluding to there, Mitch, the ultimate goal for he and his family was to become a head coach at the high major Division I college basketball level. Um, and if I know it seems a little strange when you kind of look at some of the recent hirings in college basketball, but for the most part, it's been awfully tough for an NBA assistant to end up historically as a head coach at Division I college basketball program. We don't see that very often. Again, recent memory or recent uh, transactions here in the last couple of days may change my thinking on that here in a little bit. But he knew that getting back into the college game and, quite frankly, working for a guy like Matt Painter, who's as well respected as he is across the, the college basketball landscape, he knew that that was going to ultimately be his best best path towards becoming, again, a head coach at the Division I high major level. Um, so he certainly made the right choice there. And you, I mean, again, you think about that, that's, that's a pretty risky move for you and your family. You have a pretty nice job with the Boston Celtics. You're in the NBA. You're in the playoffs every year. You're one of the top assistants in the NBA. To step down, if it is even a step down to Division I college basketball and try to rework your way back up the ladder, if you will, and to do it in two short years the way he's done it, uh, I think that tells you maybe you probably need to know about his acumen and, and his ability as a college basketball coach. What does that tell you about his confidence, though, as a person that he knows who he is and he feels that the college level is the right level for him? Yeah, and isn't that the trick, Steve? You know, you've been in this a long time. So have I. Yeah. You, you know, we so often see this that, uh, you know, the grass is not always greener, right, on the other side. You have to really understand where you fit in uh, in this great game of basketball. For some guys, it's being, a, you know, a high school coach. For other guys, certainly a small college coach. For some guys, it's all the way to the NBA level. And for guys like the Matt Painters of the world and now the Micah Shrewsbury's of the world, you know, they understand their fit. They know where they're comfortable. And more importantly, they know where their skill set can be best utilized and where they can have the most success. And uh, I, I firmly believe Micah Shrewsbury is definitely where he needs to be at, uh, at Penn State and coaching it in the Big Ten. Rob, I would be remiss if I didn't ask who has the better golf game between you and Steve here, having been a, in the Big Ten Conference now for a number of years. Uh, as of about five minutes ago, I would have said me, but what you guys don't know is earlier before our broadcast started, I was eavesdropping on your conversation. Steve telling the story of the eagle he had just a couple days ago on one of your local golf courses. So now I've changed my mind. I think Steve Rob. is probably just a smidge better than I am. Smidge, Rob. just a smidge. Rob, it saved the round. It was a total luck shot, okay? <laughs> it kept you under triple digits. I, I, I know the feeling. The, the best part about it is nobody got hurt. <laughs> Rob, appreciate you stopping by and uh, joining us this morning, dropping your insight with us on Coach Shrewsbury. Enjoy the rest of your day. Now, from Rob to Mike Carmen, who is a local beat reporter for uh, Purdue, will join us here momentarily. But before we welcome in, Mike, let's get a couple of shout outs into the audience that is watching. Welcome to Happy Valley coach Jay Flatley, yeah. 22. He is the vice president of Legion of Blue. Can't wait to watch you in the BJC, the, or the Bryce Doran Center. I know that Coach Shrewsbury immediately when I spoke to him once he was hired, yeah. that was one of the first things that he alluded yeah. to the fact he cannot wait to sell out that arena sell it out and what's going to happen the student support is going to be so pivotal to all this to get that lower level with students filled up with legion of blue and then the, the great season ticket holders around it that atmosphere is something that is going to be pivotal to any success for any program all the top programs in the country have that kind of support this guy is going to deserve that kind of support. What does that say about the culture that Coach Shrewsbury wants to try to build at Penn State as you take a live look at the VIP Zoom room with the Legion of Blue? Oh, I think that he understands. You know, when you, when you have coached at Butler, 
you've coached at Purdue, you coach with the Celtics. Look, they swing games. They, they can be points for you. And that's what he's looking at. And the players deserve that kind of support. So once we all are able to come back together as a, as a, as a family, whether it's in Beaver Stadium like that, or whether it's in the Bryce Jordan Center or Panzer Stadium or Pagula or Jeffrey or wherever it may be, yeah, I think everybody's anxious to get back, and that support is going to mean everything for the players and for him. It's going to be one of the best shots to win games, so it's also going to be important for recruiting. It's not a bad day when you see your face up inside the or, uh, the uh, Beaver Stadium, rather, in front of an empty stadium, hopefully 110,000 yeah. here in, a, in yeah. a few uh, months in the fall. Kim, ready to renew uh, your season tickets, yeah. I'm going to assume. Kim, can't wait to see you back inside the Bryce Jordan Center. To be able to do that, go to gopsusports.com and to be able to renew your tickets today. Go to psusports.com slash men's hoops. All right, let's, let's welcome in Mike Carmen, who is a local beat reporter for Purdue Hoops. Mike, appreciate you taking the time this morning. I, I'm going to ask the same question to you, Mike, that I just asked Rob. From your experience in covering Coach Shrewsbury, what type of leader is Penn State gaining? Uh, they're getting a tremendous leader. Uh, and, you know, uh, echo a lot of the things Rob said and you guys have said about him. Um, he, he's, he's kind of born to do this. This is what, this is what he set out to do in his, in his, uh, profession. And, uh, I'm just so happy he gets that opportunity. And I, you know, and I think you got to credit Penn state here, uh, in this situation because he, you know, his name was dropped early in the process. Once I think Penn state started to, to look what they wanted to do in the future. And they kind of nabbed him before a lot of these other openings came about. And I, I, I firmly believe that Micah would have been highly sought after across the country as uh, athletic directors looked at whether they were going to make a change or not. And I think he would have been scooped up by, you know, any of those openings that are there right now. Uh, so I think you got to credit Penn State for for getting out in front of this thing uh, and then getting a fine guy. And, you know, the thing of it is, Matt Painter gave him the responsibility of the offense, but he also gave him the responsibility of all those out of bounds plays and inbounds plays. And if you if you would go back through Purdue season this year and look at the number of times that they were successful uh, on an inbounds play, there was one in particular at Ohio State where they got Sasha Stefanovich open for a three that tied the game, which eventually led to Jaden Ivey hitting a hitting a game winning three pointer. All that is on. That's all. That, that's all, Micah. And that, I think a lot of that comes from his NBA background because there's so many situational things in the NBA that he has carried over to Purdue and he will carry over uh, to Penn State from an offensive standpoint. So uh, you're, getting a, you're getting a great guy, you're getting a great family guy, but you're getting a, a, a high-level basketball intelligence guy that I think really, really will pay big dividends for Penn State. Mike, in the B-roll, they showed Micah conversing with Jay Nivey. They, they showed him talking to Isaiah Thompson. How does he relate to the players along the way? Because that's going to be a big part of this, as you know, going forward. Matt Painter's great relating to his players. How's Micah with players? I mean, he does it very well. I mean, what you see in those videos is is real. I mean, he's just the guy that relates to people very well. And you've got to you've got to have a you got to be a good communicator at this at any level of coaching. But he just he has that. It, it, it's built into him. And you know, he he's had a lot of stops along the way in his career where he's been able to enhance that. And I really think the big thing that he'll bring to Penn State, not only his knowledge of the game and all the X's and O's, but just taking a piece of what Matt Painter does from a culture standpoint and making sure you're recruiting the right guys that are coachable, that are willing to put in the time, that want to be better, that crave to be better. And I, I think he'll bring a piece of that with him from Penn State. And that will just, I think, open up more doors for him and open up more avenues for him to be able to get the right kind of kids that he's going to figure out that, that, that are going to work for him and work for Penn State. Mike, you mentioned the word recruiting, and that's going to be such a pivotal part to Penn State's success here in the future. From your experience in covering the Big Ten, how will he have to make an impact on the recruiting trail, specifically in the Big Ten? Well, uh, you know, this year was a big man's league in the Big Ten, and it's not always going to be that way. Uh, I, I just think you have to get the guys that, that fit uh, what you want to be about and fit the culture that you want to establish there. 
And, uh, and that's, you know, and that's, you know, it's kind of hard to do at times because everybody wants the, the five-star athletes and, um, you know, the dynamic players. But if you don't have good chemistry and you don't have good culture, uh, you're, you're, you're going to struggle. And, and I think that's going to be his number one objective. Just, you want to find talented players, no doubt, but you, you got to find guys that fit and that are willing to play together and willing to work hard together uh, in the off season to, to make their team and their program better. You know, you talk about the, the five-star recruit. A lot of what Purdue's done, they've obviously done a great job with recruiting, but they've also done a really good job, Mike, as you know, with player development. Right. So what kind of player developer is Micah Shrewsbury? Well, I think you saw a little bit of it this year with the freshmen that they had, and especially the redshirt freshmen. When you look at Mason Gillis and Brandon Newman, two guys that sat out last year, and you know Matt Painter is not shy about redshirting players. Uh, I know that's sometimes used against him in the recruiting trail, but uh, the payoff comes down the road. And when you look like a guy like Mason Gillis and, and Brandon Newman and what they did this year for Purdue, along with the, the true freshmen, uh, you know, Jay Nivey and Zach Eady and, the, and that group, um, you, you saw their development uh, and their growth kind of from game to game to game. I mean, Jay Nivey has certain skills that you can't teach, but you've got to, you've got to bring that all together. So it works uh, with your program and it works with other players. And I think Micah was, was big, especially in the guard developments with, with Newman and Ivy uh, of, of pushing those guys forward and, you know, getting them in a position where they, they were comfortable playing uh, with a high level of confidence. And I, you know, as, as the year go, went on, those that watched Purdue, you know, you could tell that the, the, those freshmen were improving every day. Mike, at the end of Micah Shrewsbury tenure at Penn State, looking in the future, what will you be saying about his success at Penn State? Well, I mean, I, I truly hope it is a successful run. I know that, you know, the, the program's had some, had some troubles of, you know, finding the right guy to, to be, to, to take leadership of this. And I, you know, and I, you, you can't, everybody wants to measure by, you know, championships and all that kind of stuff. But I think you want to put, I think he needs to put Penn state in a position. So they, uh, they're recruiting well, uh, they're, they're taking care of their home base in, in, in the Pennsylvania and in the Northeast area. Uh, but then you want to, you just want to be in a position to challenge for championships. You want to get in the NCAA tournament. You want to get the postseason. You want to, you want to, you just want to be one of those teams that every year, uh, that they look at and say, well, okay, yeah, maybe Penn State can win it this year, or Penn State's going to be one of the top three teams in the Big Ten. And I think he'll push that program up, up in the Big Ten standings. It's going to take a little time because of some of the, the heavyweights you, ha- you do have to deal with on a yearly basis. Uh, but, it's you, you can get a lot of quick answers these days with the transfer market and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I think I think a successful tenure will be one where he it's a consistent program that challenges for the Big Ten, challenges for the Big Ten tournament and is a regular participant in the NCAAs. Mike, appreciate you stopping by and joining us. Great insight from you and uh, continued success to, to yourself. All right. Well, thank you very much. Mike. That's Mike Carmen, local beat reporter for Purdue. He has covered Micah Shrewsbury for years mm-hmm. on in. And we're going to welcome in Dick Girardi here in a second, who is Steve's counterpart, obviously. But I thought the transfer portal comment was significant in the fact that you look at a guy like Isaiah Brockington, meets with Coach Shrewsbury, decides that he's mm-hmm. going to come back. How big yeah. of an impact is that? Well, it is big because this is what I, the theory I had about this, Mitch. Look, he's a great guy. I mean, it doesn't take long. You interviewed him, I interviewed him. When I was done, like, this is a terrific guy. You and I know the players here. They're terrific guys. And I thought if a terrific guy could get together with a group of terrific guys, they could talk things and say, this is the vision for what I have, and the players would start to come back. Isaiah Brockney was the first one to do that. That was important because I think it just sends a message that they're on track with, with guys because, look, you're going to need a base of players to start with, right? And then from that base of players, then you can start building around it. Instead of trying to fill so many gaps immediately, you can really concentrate on your November 21 recruiting class, your November 22 recruiting class, he and Adam Fisher working on that. And believe me, hiring Adam Fisher is a big plus. I know when Dick comes on, we're gonna talk about that. 
Why is it a big plus? It's a big plus because he knows Penn State and he knows Pennsylvania and he knows Southeastern Pennsylvania. Adam's done a great job in his career recruiting across the board and, of course, his latest stop in Miami. Some of the bigger names that they had at Miami with Jim Laranega, Adam Fisher was a big part of that. But he's also a Penn State guy that knows this place, knows the culture, and understands how it works. Let's welcome in Dick Girardi to the broadcast and follow up on that question. Dick, you've covered this Penn State men's basketball program for a number of years. Why do you feel that Adam Fisher is a great addition to Coach Shrewsbury's staff? Yeah, I think to one of the points Steve made, Adam, as everybody knows, was a student manager, then a graduate manager under Ed DeCella. So I've known Adam for more than 15 years, and his background is just perfect. And I think it was a, a sensational hire by Micah. And I think it, it, it tells you that he understands the market. He understands Penn State. He understands the state of Pennsylvania. So Adam's background, ma a student manager, then a graduate manager on a Final Four team for Jay Wright in 2009 at Villanova. Then he went to Boston University and then Penn State with Coach Chambers. And then, as Steve said, he's been at, at uh, Miami now for quite a long time. And his star player at Miami right now is a kid named Isaiah Wong, who's from Bonner Prendergast out of the Philadelphia Catholic League. And prior to that, he got uh, Adam was a huge recruiter and Lonnie Walker from Reading High School yep. on their first of two state championships. Of course, they just won another one Saturday night. By the way, you are the brains of the operation. Just so, you, <laughs> just want to make sure everybody knows that, uh, Dick. It's not it, the, between the transfer portal, but also the ability. You know, when James Franklin came here, he said, "Dominate the state." How important is it in basketball that if you're going to dominate the state, that the southeastern part of the state becomes an important uh, component in it, based on what we've seen in recent years? Yeah, look, that's where the players are. It's not that complicated, right? The Philadelphia Catholic League is not just the best league in Pennsylvania. It's one of the best leagues in the country. And Penn State has made great inroads, obviously, in recent years. And Steve and Mitch, if you look at the last four years, by all the performance metrics, the program has been top 50 nationally. I know the record didn't show it in two of those four years, but we all know about the close losses. This team, if they had gotten to play all their games over the last four years, would have about 80 wins. And a lot of those wins are from player help from players from the Philadelphia area. So, yeah, I think that's gigantic. I think the fact that – I think Mike obviously realized that. That's where the players are. Look, they had a commitment – from Purdue, I know he's since decommitted from from Philadelphia kids. So he they know the, they know the market, and and having Adam alongside as associate head coach, I think is just a great move. Coach Shrewsbury's press conference is coming up at the top of the hour, noon Eastern time, 11 Central. He'll meet with the general public and then the local media as well as you can take a look behind us right now. The NLC, which are donor members, will also be in attendance to be able to support the hiring of Micah Shrewsbury. Now tonight at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, 5 Central. Be sure to come back and join us on Penn State men's basketball social pages for our Welcome to Happy Valley live show. Uh, Coach Shrewsbury is going to introduce us, the Penn State community, to his family and members that uh, we've experienced or we've talked about here, rather, with some NBA talent. I'm going to tease that. Yeah. NBA talent. That's yeah. the best way to put that. Five minutes until the press conference for Coach Shrewsbury as we will carry that live here. Dick, we've spoke often about culture. We've heard that term across the street inside the Lash football complex with head coach James Franklin. What does Coach Shrewsbury need to do within the next month to two months to be able to establish his culture around Penn State men's basketball? Yeah, obviously, as Steve was just saying, and you were, I'm, I'm sure, too, Mitch, just I mean, meet with the players that were already here, and I'm sure he's already done that. Try to meet with some of the players who are in the transfer portal, talk to them about what he's about. And then obviously they got to get on the road recruiting and get players. But yeah, just look, the all you got to do is, and I think it's his best attribute, point to where he's been, who he's been with. Uh, he's obviously was in Boston and at Butler with Brad Stevens. And you just mentioned players like Gordon Hayward, who was on the, the Butler uh, team that went to the final four in 2010 and then uh in boston having a guy like jason tatum say hey this was a great coach and really helped me that's huge and i think any recruit is going to understand that because these are people they can watch on tv any night of the week if they have lead pass for the nba and dick what about the nba concepts you pick up everything along the way We've seen Jawan Howard and what he's doing. What can those NBA concepts mean at the college level? Watch the second half of the Michigan-Florida yeah. State game the other night. It was classic. If you watch some of those high-low stuff, that's right out of the NBA. Yeah. 
and it and you could actually hear Juwan because it, in the gym there's no there's very few people you could actually hear him calling out the play. So yeah. that's obviously stuff, and I saw a lot of that stuff from Butler and the Celtics and 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 Purdue as well. Matt Painter's a, a tremendous coach, so I think it was great for Micah to get back to college for a couple of years. And and Steve, you and I raved all year long about Jaden Ivey and what a great player he yeah. was. And yeah. if you watch him from November to March, you're going, wow, that didn't yeah. happen by accident. That's coaching. Coach Shrewsbury just about set to address the media and the donors in the room as well as the rest of the general public on uh, the top of the hour, noon Eastern time to be specific. He is just off of our set right now, and I believe he's going to walk over this way. What's up, Coach? How you guys doing? Good. Welcome to Happy Valley. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great Glad to, see to officially you. see you. Yes, yeah. Yeah. officially yeah. see you. It's not a phone call this time. No, not a phone call this time. <laughs> That'll be one of the last phone calls we have. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we got to do a lot of stuff in person. Yeah. How exciting a day is this for you personally that you are being handed the baton of a program that is your program? You know, I'm really excited about this. And, you know, I'm looking forward to getting up, sharing my vision here shortly. Um, meeting a lot of people here today, um, but really like becoming more of a part of the Nittany Lion family, which I'm so excited to be a part of. Coach, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to do this thing all over again, and we're going to get to meet some of uh, your personal family members as well as the people that are important to you. What are you looking forward to tonight, 6 o'clock? I, I'm interested to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys probably have a great show planned. Um, I'm going to enjoy, like, just having fun tonight, and that's a big part of it. I want everybody to kind of meet me and see who I am and um, the playful side. So yeah. it should be fun tonight. All right, you go do your thing. Great to see you. Thanks Thank for stopping by. Thanks Once again, that's going to be 6 o'clock tonight. So right back here on Penn State Men's Basketball Social Handles as uh, we, w- we welcome Micah Shrewsbury officially to the Happy Valley community. Dick, before we let you go, is that bird on the windowsill real or no? Not real. <laughs> Yeah. Not real whatsoever. No, just, I mean, look, I know it, it's made to look real, Mitch, but yeah, not actually real. But there's a lot of real birds just outside the way. Yeah. Dick, appreciate you stopping by <laughs> and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Go outside and enjoy it as you get a live look there at Happy Valley, the Bryce Jordan Center on a beautiful afternoon here in the State College community. It was a beautiful sunrise as it set over Mount Nittany, or rose rather, over Mount Nittany this, this morning around 7 o'clock or so yeah. on my drive uh, post-workout. So obviously a great day in Happy Valley. The weather's starting to turn, so that Steve can continue his golf game. He's got seven rounds in at this point in time. Absolutely. None of them good. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we did have that eagle on 18. All right, so Coach Shrewsbury is about to address the media. Let's go to the podium which is right behind us, to hear from Coach Shrewsbury. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started here today. Um, Just a reminder, and this is the first time I've actually said this in like over a year, uh, (laughs) put your cell phones on vibrate, off, or mute, um, which I'm sure our media folks would get a little bit of a kick out of. So uh, thank you very much for joining today's press conference with our new men's basketball coach, Micah Shrewsbury, and our vice president for intercollegiate athletics, Sandy Barber. Um, What we'll do today is we'll have Sandy um, uh, make some comments. We'll also have Coach Shrewsbury make a few comments, and then our media is joining via Zoom. Uh, After uh, we finish all the comments, our media folks will ask some questions on on Zoom. And when we wrap up, we'll have the opportunity to have a brief Q&A with uh, you folks here. And then we'll also have an opportunity to meet and greet uh, with Coach Shrewsbury. We're just holding a little bit here for Big Ten Network, so everything's made for TVs these, these days. <laughs> I see our media is joining uh, via Zoom right now. So once again, uh, welcome everybody to our, uh, our welcome press conference for new men's basketball coach Micah Shrewsbury. Uh, I would like at this time to bring up Vice President for Intercollegiate Athletics, Sandy Barber. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome to our media joining via, via Zoom. And welcome to all of you uh, here today that are, that are joining us, uh, our alumni, staff, community who have historically uh, supported our men's basketball 
program and help support our student athletes and their success both on and off the court. It's really nice uh, to see you all uh, in person. Uh, love the opportunity and the occasion uh, for you to, to gather today. Um, at this very different time, obviously, it's great to be together. Um, and of course, it's fantastic to have this opportunity to officially introduce Micah Shrewsbury as our head men's basketball coach. And together, for us to welcome he and his wife, Molly, their sons, Braden and Nick, their daughters, Caitlin and Gracie, and of course, Rosie the dog to welcome them uh, to the Penn State family and to the community. This search was about finding the right leader for Penn State men's basketball and that leader who will create success, create sustained success in the most competitive conference in all of college basketball. I'd like to thank Dr. Barron and our board of trustees for their support in this search, the desire, their desire, and passion to seek a leader who would bring us high-level success was powerful throughout the search. I'm incredibly appreciative of the work of our search committee, Dennis Scanlon, our faculty athletics representative, our director of ethics and compliance, Kenya Mann Faulkner, and our two deputy athletic directors, Lynn Holleran and Scott Sidwell. There were some long hours some late nights, early mornings, as we steered this ship home. So thank you to that group. Given the time horizon of this search, we were able to talk to literally hundreds of people about candidates, as well as the state of college men's basketball in general, and about the state of Penn State men's basketball specifically. The goal was, is, and always will be for this program to compete successfully year in and year out in the Big Ten and compete for those championships. The Big Ten is the best conference in all of college men's basketball and we all know that if we are competing in the Big Ten successfully then we'll be a force on the national scene as well. It's important to note through those conversations, through those hundreds of conversations, there was no one, not a one person that we talked to that didn't believe we could achieve our stated goals. We can and will do in men's basketball at Penn State what we've done almost entirely across the board in Penn State athletics, and that is to compete for Big Ten titles, and to get to the NCAA tournament consistently. Dr. Barron and I invited Micah to join us, to partner with us, to go on this journey in creating that sustained success, to provide young men in the program, both today's young men and those that will join Micah in the future. We invited him to help us provide them with the conditions they require for success both in the classroom, on the court, and in the community. And to provide our community, the local state college community, and that greater Penn State nation, those 700,000 plus alumni, the largest alumni base in the world, provide all of the Penn State family with a point of pride in our success on the basketball court and what the program and the young men will do off the court as well. We invited Micah because he represents not only all of the required basketball technical skills from a coaching, recruiting, program development standpoint, but because he demonstrates the values, the values around total development of students that are so important to our Penn State community. He has a wide variety of experiences that we felt were important and informative to his future success as our head coach at Penn State, experiences as an assistant coach in programs that have had success at the level we aspire to, experience and familiarity with the Big Ten, experience in the NBA, and he's had mentorship and guidance and modeling from some of the brightest and most successful minds in the business. But when all the basketball boxes were checked, it was about his desire 
to be at Penn State, his passion, skills, and abilities to shape and positively influence the lives of young men in his care. As you'll hear from Coach Shrewsbury here in a moment, it's about their opportunity today, that opportunity provided by basketball, opportunity on the court, opportunity in the classroom, opportunity to access and take you to 700,000 Penn State alumni and their, your success. And it's about what's down the road, developing opportunities beyond their time at Penn State that are made available, whether that be in professional basketball or it be in a career outside of basketball, either upon graduation or after professional basketball is done. Micah rose quickly to the top of what I considered to be a very deep and talented pool. And it was clear to me at the time, and now nine days into it, it's even more apparent, that he and his staff will do incredible things at Penn State, both in basketball and in our greater community. And that, that we will be celebrating much success for Penn State men's basketball under Micah's leadership. So ladies and gentlemen, here in person and afar, please join me in officially welcoming Micah Shrewsbury, Penn State head men's basketball coach. Thank you for uh, those kind words, Sandy. Um, I just first of all want to say um, thank you, Dr. Barron. Thank you to Sandy, um, Lynn, Scott, the rest of the search committee um, that I had the honor to meet with um, in, in pursuing this job. It, it was something that everything that you dream of, Penn State is for me. And you know, I'm honored to be standing here and honored to be your next head coach. I wrote some, a few notes down. Uh, I usually don't do this, but I'll try and stick to the plan. I, they don't have the, the boards up, but there was an itinerary earlier, and it just had Coach Shrewsbury comments, but it didn't have a time next to it. So <laughs> I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I also don't want this to run into the 6 o'clock segment later on, so I will try and keep this as brief as possible. But... You know, I stand here alone right now, um, but there's many thank yous and many people that I need to thank. And, you know, this journey's not my own, um, and, and it hasn't, it's never been easy. Uh, but my wife, Molly, has been with me uh, every step of the way. And I'm so appreciative of her, um, her friendship, and everything that she's put up with, with me throughout this journey. And, you know, we accomplished this together. It's, it's not me, it's not what I've done, it's what we've done as a family. And my children the same way, Braden, Nick, Caitlin, Grace. Um, you know, I hope you're in school right now. I know Braden's online, so he's probably watching the other three. I hope you're in school right now, and you can check it out later on, uh, go PSU Sports later on. But um, my family has moved, they, they've you know, kind of rode with the, the, the progress of what we've done. And they've been a big, big part of everything that, that I've done and been able to accomplish. And I'm glad I can share all of that with them. So they're the first people I need to thank. Um, people talk about me and they talk about my character. And that's big for me. And treating people the right way, I think you can go um, a long ways by doing that. And again, this journey's not my own. And where I get that from is my parents. 
uh, William and Brenda Shrewsbury were great examples to me of how to roll up your sleeves and work every single day, how to treat people the right way, and where you can go in life and where that can take you in life. And I'm so appreciative of them and the lessons they've taught me throughout my you know, young career so far. Um, my sisters, Michelle, Monica, cousins, uh, nieces, nephews, everybody. Um, I have, my mom has a huge family, my dad has a family, and we will fill a section of the BJC this year. And there's a lot of people backing me and supportive right now. Um, I love each and every one of you guys. This is our journey together. Um, you know, in this career, you know, there, there's two people that get a lot of credit for helping me and, and developing me as a coach. Uh, but there's a lot of people before that. And, you know, my high school coach, Howard Renner, to my college coach, Mike Beitzel, um, Todd Sturgeon, who gave me my first opportunity as a coach, Mac Petty, um, Bill Finland, I could go on and on, Ron Jersa, uh, a lot of people have really given me an opportunity to grow and to learn, and I owe them so much through it in this business of, of how to run a successful program. Um, and then finally, you know, Brad Stevens and Matt Painter. And I couldn't say enough about those two guys as, as friends, as people, before bosses. I, I, they never treated me as a boss and as an employee. It was always as a great man and how you run a successful program. I learned so much from them. And, you know, I have to be myself, but they taught me how to run a successful program. And, and I'm appreciative of what they did for me in every step of this way. You know, I've worked for two of the best coaches you could ever uh, be around and work for, you know, in, in a short amount of time and those two guys. And I'm forever grateful for their friendships. They still take my calls to this day. You know, Coach Painter is, is in our league and he's still trying to help me with the struggles that I go through in these last nine days. Uh, I wish I could say it's been all rosy, but you know, everybody's gonna have ups and downs and everybody's gonna have bad days and I know I have those two guys to reach out to. There's a lot of other former players, coaches that I've worked with and, and I appreciate everything they've done for me. Um, during this short time, I, I've had a chance to to reach out and talk to a lot of the former coaches from Penn State. I've talked to a lot of former players from Penn State. I've talked to a lot of alumni and interacted with everyone that I can, and I want to continue to do it. It's the largest alumni base in the world, and it's going to take me a little bit of time to get to everybody, <laughs> but I promise I'll try my best. Uh, but what I've told everybody that I've talked to is this is their program. It's not mine. You know, I'm just the guy that, that's in charge of putting our players in the right position to succeed, but this is their program. There's a lot that's gone into building this place and making it a special place, and I'm steering it in the right direction, and I want to put our guys in the right direction to continue to lead us to great places along the way. But I need to do right by those guys, and I need to do right by the alumni nation and the former players and coaches, and everything that we do, every decision I make is with the best interest of Penn State at heart. And I believe that. And the one way that we do that is by striving and trying to match the values of this university. And that's really important to me of how we conduct ourselves on the court, off the court, and in the community. And excellence being the main part of that. And with 31 other sports at this university and every single one of us striving for excellence, that's a huge part of why I wanted to come here. You know, to have those other coaches to lean on, to have their expertise, to have their knowledge, and just pick each other's brain, but also push each other to be great. And I think we can be great here if we uphold all of the values of this university and uphold those values of who we want to be as a Penn State basketball team. And I'm really excited to, to do that. And, you know, when you talk about kind of who we want to be and, and who we're going to be, you know, I, I want to be an underdog type of team. You know, this team, you know, I, I, I have much respect for 
Coach Chambers and Coach Ferry and what they did. I have much respect for the guys that played last season and how hard they played every single night out. And this season was hard. It was under tough circumstances with COVID and everything else. But they gave their all for Penn State, and I'm going to give my all for those guys. And But I appreciate every bit of it. But we're going to keep that underdog mentality. We're going to keep that chip on our shoulder mentality. And I think you succeed in that way. And for me, I've kind of been that way my whole life. And I want a team that models after that. It's funny, one of my you know, dear friends with the Celtics, we had a lot of talks um, in the last few years as jobs have opened and closed. And you know, I was still an assistant with the Boston Celtics. And jobs opened and closed, and I was still the associate head coach at Purdue. And you, know, you have a, long, a lot of long hours, long conversations. And he told me, and I'll, I'll never forget this, to, to be thankful for your nose. You know, be thankful for the nose in life that you've gotten because something greater is waiting and there's something greater around the corner. And I'm forever thankful for the people that did say no to me. I'm, I'm not going to forget who said no. You know, that, that's the chip on my shoulder, underdog mentality. I won't forget who said no, but I'm thankful for that because something greater was right around the corner and that something greater is Penn State University and this basketball program. I appreciate your time. Um, thank you, and I look forward to meeting everyone, uh, but also having a, a great run as your next head coach at Penn State. Thank you. We'll take a little bit of time here to, uh, to take some questions from our media. Uh, first up will be Mark Brennan, Lions 247 with Fight on State, and Ben Jones, you'll be next. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Michael, welcome to State College and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, with regard to the transfer portal, uh, we know that Brock is coming back. Have you gotten a definitive answer from any of the other players who had entered? And more generally speaking, how do you treat kids when they go into that portal? Are those uh, scholarship spots open? Are you recruiting to them? Do you give them a timeline to maybe come back? Uh, can you take us through that a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's a subject that, you know, we, we don't comment on publicly uh, about the transfer portal, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things out there right now that are public. And this is a unique time in college basketball. You know, there's, there's more transfers in the portal today than there were last year the entire time. And it's a unique time to come in as a head coach. Um, I, I've talked to every single one of the guys that, um, you know, have entered, and we are actively trying to get them back. We're talking about them. We're talking to them. We're having conversations face-to-face uh, -face, over Zoom on FaceTime. Uh, but we are actively recruiting as well. And my goal is, is to, you know, have a great team in place when it's time to tip off next season. And that's what we're going to do. Um, that's what we're striving to do. And there are a lot of great players that are out there, uh, but we want our own. But we also want guys that are two feet in for Penn State, that bleed Penn State, that believe in this, that believe in our vision. And when we have that group, uh, we're going to have a special group and we're going to do some fun things together. Ben Jones, statecollege.com, and then we'll have Dave Jones. Hey, Mike, nice to meet you. Welcome to State College. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, Purdue has obviously had success in Philadelphia and Southeast Pennsylvania, but that is obviously not the program's bread and butter. I'm curious how you would define the relationship that you have with that city and that part of the state. Recruiting in Philadelphia. You know, Philadelphia has been a it, it's been a good place for Penn State here lately, and I think we continue to find the right players, whether they're you know, from Philadelphia, or whether they're from Pittsburgh, whether they're from Harrisburg, wherever it may be, you know, I think we need to have a base of where we recruit from. But, you know, when you have a school like Penn State, a name like Penn State, uh, large alumni following and base, I think we can stretch our recruiting out to a lot of different areas. And, you know, we're excited to get to know everyone. We've had, you know, great feedback so far. 
um, in terms of the different areas and the places that we can recruit. But we want to find the right fits for us. And, you know, wherever that kid may come from, if he fits my values, if he fits the values of Penn State and he, he fits the guys in our locker room, then we're going to recruit him, whether he's from Philadelphia or whether he's from Hawaii. Dave Jones, Penn Live, and Corey Geiger, you're next. Micah, thanks for talking to us. Um, I am curious what went into the decision to uh, remain coaching at Purdue against North Texas uh, rather than come immediately to Penn State. Different coaches have done that, done that different ways, and it's always a difficult situation, difficult decision. What went into yours? It, it was a really difficult decision, um, but – you know, I, I owe a lot in my career to Matt Painter. And, you know, my goal was to help him try and get to a Final Four when I left there. I never told him that. Uh, we never talked about that. But that was my goal. And, you know, he's an unbelievable coach. And I wanted him to have that experience. So my loyalty to him, my loyalty to those players, uh, really – you know, it made it an easy decision for me to stay. And, you know, I had great support um, from Sandy and Lynn, and they, you know, they really backed my decision to stay. And I felt like I owed it to that team, that group of guys. You only get one opportunity with a team. You know, your team changes from year to year. And what we had this year was special. We had a young team. Nobody thought we were going to be able to do anything. We finished fourth in the Big Ten. And I wanted to see that through. You know, it caused a lot of um, long nights and early mornings of, you know, preparing to be the coach here uh, while also preparing for the game there. And, you know, I still, you know, second-guess myself and have, you know, not regrets, but, you know, I just I, I wanted to give my all to both sides. And I felt like I did that, so I'm okay with the results. I just wanted to win you know, I, I love winning, and I felt like I owed it to the guys there. I love those guys in that locker room, and they gave us everything they had. Uh, but I wanted to see that through, and I felt like that was the right move to see it through, to be a part of that group and finish what we started. Corey Geiger, Nittany Sports Now, and Nate Bauer, you're on deck. Hi, Micah. Welcome. Sandy talked about sustained success and competing year in and year out in the toughest conference. That is something Penn State has had a challenge doing uh, for a long time. How do you do that? How, how does Penn State go from its history and tradition to a level of sustained success? You know, I think it starts with the guys in your locker room first. You know, building the character and culture of a program. You know, they're your best recruiters. And the guys in your locker room, if you're giving them everything that you have every single day, they're going to attract more people like that. They're going to attract more people to your program. And now we're recruiting the right guys. Like I said, it's got to be the fit. The fit is the most important thing. I don't think you can go for um, the quick fix sometimes or what's easy or what is attractive. You need to do what's best for your program. And, like, that's what I'm going to do. That's going to be my goal. Um, in who we bring into our locker room. And then from there, like, we have to be a great defensive team. You know, to have a chance in the Big Ten, you have to be one of the top uh, defensive teams in our league. And if you go back and look through the stats, I want to say the top seven teams on the defensive side of the ball were all teams that made the tournament. You know, there was an eighth team that snuck in there, and then nine went to the NCAA tournament. If you watch the teams that are playing – right now that are left in the Elite Eight, they're all elite defensive teams. Unless you're a Gonzaga and you're an elite offensive team. But you have to have a defensive mindset, and that's how you win in this league. And I've had a chance to see it um, up close and personal these last two years, but the other two years in the league of you know how we can do that, how we can try and be one of those teams. If we're consistent in that area, we're giving ourselves a chance every night where the ball goes in or not, and we give ourselves a chance to win. And if you do that, you can stay consistent within this league. Nate Bauer, Blue Illustrated. Audrey Snyder, you're on deck. Hi, Micah. <clears throat> uh, obviously, 
pros and cons to every big major life choice. What what was appealing and what fit for you uh, taking this opportunity at Penn State? And if you could, what were some of the cons? What were some of the challenges uh, that you anticipate uh, on taking this uh, position? I'm going to tell you the the cons list was a lot shorter than the pros list. Um, yeah, I, I I believe in you know this administration. You know, Dr. Barron talking, the more I got to talk to Sandy, the more I got to talk to Lynn and everyone else, um, you see how special they are, how they believe in this place. And that's the most important thing. If you have a partnership like that, then you can have success. You know, when you, when you have good days and bad days and you know that, that the people in charge have your back, that gives you a great feeling. Um, and that's a great joy, but that's something that was really attractive to me. The other sports that are having a lot of success, that makes this very attractive. Um, that makes this a great job. If nobody was having success at Penn State, then you would have a little bit of pause. But there are a lot of teams having success, and we want to strive to be in that conversation with them. Like, we want to push ourselves to... You know, women's soccer just won the Big Ten championship. Like, we want, we want to do it next. I'm jealous of what they just did. You know, uh, Coach Keeger and I want to push each other every day in practice and, you know, fist bump each other as we're walking through the office to, you know, push each other to be better. Like, that's, that's what I want to do, and that's a big part of why I came here. I didn't have any cons. Um, you know, I was looking for an opportunity. I was picking in that opportunity, but – this place provided uh, a great, you know, kind of first opportunity to um, go somewhere that's special. And this is a special place. It'll always be a special place. And I want to make it special for everybody that's a part of this. Audrey Snyder, The Athletic. Rich Scarcella, you're next. This question's for, for Sandy Barber, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, Sandy, I just wanted to get your reaction on the guys in the transfer portal. Were you surprised by the movement, and did you try to relay that to Coach Shrewsbury at all during the interview process that, you know, there was a likelihood that that could happen? Yeah, Audrey, I mean, obviously, uh, with with where we are uh, as an NCAA as it relates to uh, football and men's and women's basketball and hockey, and I think the other sport is baseball uh, transfers and, and the upcoming legislation about allowing them to transfer freely without sitting out a year, We, we you, you, so you've got the national context, um, and then you have the Penn State context. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, with where we are in college athletics, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. Um, and, and I always believed, um, I told many as we had discussions that were close to the program that, uh, you know, regardless of what our situation was, that there was going to be lots of student athlete movement. Um, across uh, across college men's basketball. Uh, certainly talked to Micah about it in in the in the process, um, and and he rightfully pointed out that this is all about relationships. Uh, and uh, so he talked about uh, you know getting the job, still being with Purdue, but he did a ton of work um, as it related to to starting those relationships with the young men in our program. Um, and I think as we've seen over the course of uh, of now you know, ten, nine, ten days or, or so, um, uh, actually two weeks now, that, uh, that if we exhibit a little bit of patience, uh, give these young men time, and it's exactly what I told them uh, when I announced uh, Micah's hire, which is that, you know, I hope that they would um, – uh, take a look at this uh, this opportunity now that was in front of them at Penn State under Coach Shrewsbury's leadership uh, and that they would assess that uh, and that they would make then their decisions about what's right for them and, and their families um, and we would support them 100% uh, in that and, and particularly as it relates to finishing up strong academically um, and making sure they put themselves in the best position. Rich Scarcella, Reading Eagle, John Sauber, you're next. Good afternoon, Micah. I have a two-part question. One, um, can you name one thing that you learned from Brad Stevens and one thing you learned from Matt Painter? And secondly, why was Adam Fisher your first hire? Thank you. Okay, I'll answer the first question first. I may need help on the <laughs> second you. part. Um, 
One thing I learned from Brad Stevens is his, his detail in his um, approach to preparation. He's one of the best I've been around. There's no stone unturned when he is preparing for a game, when he is preparing for practice, when he is preparing for a season. And working with him, you know, there's questions that come up in a film session, and, you know, it could be you would think it's the oddest thing. Um, you're like, why, why is he asking that question? Like, I've never seen a team do that in seven games or ever as I'm preparing. And then it happens in the game. It's like it's almost like he has a, a sixth sense of what situations are going to come up. Uh, but his preparation, being able to go through everything and not leave anything, any stone unturned to prepare your team for any situation that comes up is what I learned from him. Coach Painter is probably the most low ego coach um, that I've ever been around. And he really showed me a lot about his program, you know, how to run a successful program. You know, he talked about the mistakes that he made and really said, why do you have to make these mistakes when I've already made them? And, you know, he, he's, he's had ups, he's had downs, but he stayed the same in who he is as a person. And, you know, when he started winning, he got back to the things that he was always successful with. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't um, ever, like, doubt, you know, who he takes as a player. Like, he trusts his gut. He knows who it is. It may not be the, the player that everybody across the country thinks is going to get it done. But he wins. He wins in, in that way and with his own special player. Uh, so that's what I've learned with him is trust your gut, be yourself, be confident in your values, and you know, kind of learn that way. Why was Adam your first hire? Adam Fisher. Adam Fisher? That was the question? Why would you oh, that, like <laughs> He's probably watching right now, so I want to make sure I don't talk, you know, too great about him. Or it's like, you know, Rebecca and Olivia are going to have to deal with that for the rest of the day if I say too many great things. He, he was somebody that I zeroed in on quickly. Um, you know, he, he came highly recommended. Uh, he's a great basketball mind. He's a people person. And he bleeds Penn State. And he believes in this place, and he believes in doing special things. So it, it was an easy choice for me. Um, you know, you start to look at things as, as this job, I thought it was becoming a possibility, and I, you start to narrow down who you would like to have on your staff. He was number one on my list. Um, I'm so thrilled that he said yes. I'm excited to have his family join our family. And... Uh, every day, like he, we, we just have fun. Like we have fun, we work together, we roll up our sleeves, and I, I'm going to really enjoy him, but I think everybody else is really going to enjoy him too. John Sauber, Center Daily Times. Mark Wogan, Rich, you're next. Hi, Mike. Uh, employing assistants as coordinators, like Matt Turner did with you, and, and what did you learn as sort of the head of the offense at Purdue? John, can you repeat your question? You broke up quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Do you plan on employing assistants as coordinators, like Matt Painter did? And what did you learn as the head of the Purdue offense? Um, I haven't decided yet if I want to do that. Um, we will have guys that are specializing in what they do, uh, but how we did it was was pretty unique at Purdue, and you know I. I'll, a lot goes into that, so I'll make that choice down the line. Um, but what I learned was, you know, I took a lot of the things that I learned in the, in the NBA uh, about how to think on your feet pretty quickly, about how to adjust to how the defense is playing you, um, really looking at the game through that lens and making the changes to put your team in the best position possible. And I thought we tried to do that. Um, you have to – I don't think you can be married to one certain way of playing and then your players don't fit that way. I think you need to be able to adjust. I think you need to be able to think on your feet. I think you need to be able to, you know, on the fly change things up. 
and that's what I learned by just doing the offensive coordinator role at Purdue and you know that's what we'll do here we want to put our players in the best position to succeed and whether that means from one game to the next is different it's going to be that way uh, but that's you know part of learning in the NBA and growing and being able to adjust. Mark Woganrich, SI.com. Daniel Gallen, you're next. Hi, Michael. We saw you at Penn State Pro Day last week. What impact did Coach James Franklin have upon your decision-making process, and how did he maybe um, help convince you to come to Penn State? I mean, you, you think of James Franklin, you think of a great man, you know, first and foremost. Uh, his energy, his excitement, um, I like, I know my place in this university. <laughs> I, I, I need him to help us recruit, and that's huge for me. I love it. I, I love college football. I, I'm a huge college football fan, and I don't watch, you know, much NFL football unless it's my favorite team, but I watch college football, and I watch it a lot, and being able to have – you know, a man like James Franklin, a coach like him to learn from, to pick his brain, to, you know, the, the good and the bad of this place. Uh, he's reached out. He's, he's just asked questions. He's asked how he could help. And, you know, he's going through spring football practice right now. He's got a lot on his plate, but he's trying to help me. And I, I'm just, like, thrilled to have someone like that. Uh, you know, as well as the other coaches. They're, they're, everybody here in this department has reached out to me and, and has welcomed me to this family. And I think it's a huge family in this athletic department that, you know, we can all work together. There's, you know, I have zero wins right now. And, you know, last week two of our coaches hit 600 and 200. Like, that's a long way away. But, you know, I, they were at zero at one point as well. So, like, I want to ask them, how, how, how do you get there? How are we doing this? And Coach Franklin's a big part of that, but so is everybody else in this athletic department. We won't talk about Coach Rose's 1,400 wins. That's a long <laughs> way away. Uh, Daniel Gallen, uh, Penn Live. Elton Hayes, you're on deck. Hey, Mike. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, during your opening statement, uh, you said that things haven't necessarily been uh, all rosy, and there's been some ups and downs. I was curious uh, kind of what you meant by that and what kind of challenges uh, over these past two weeks you know it, it's you know to get to a level like this professionally it it takes a lot of challenges there are a lot of challenges that you face I, I didn't play high level basketball you know I played at division three which, which is high level I wasn't even like I was just a solid player there there's way better players and way better division three teams right now than the level I played at no knock on my teammates from Hanover, if any <laughs> of you guys are watching this. Uh, but, you know, I didn't have the backing of a strong Division I coach uh, pushing me to help me get a job. Um, I, had to, I had to grind it, you know, as the kids like to say, through the mud is how I got it. Um, you know, I coached in Division Three, I coached in Division Two, I coached at the NAIA level. You know, I was the head coach for two years at the NAI level, and I still did our team's laundry. I still went out and swept the floors if we needed to. I drove the van to the game. Like, nothing within my journey has been sexy. <laughs> and that's, like, those are the challenges. My wife, you know, we were engaged to get married, and I didn't have a job. I just finished as a GA at DePaul, and I interviewed for a lot of different places, and I you know, part of being thankful for your nose, I didn't get any of them. And I got married and I didn't even have a job. Like, talk about sticking with somebody through everything. And I was, I was, you know, kind of living in a bedroom at her parents' house. And look at me now, Molly, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she saw something in me, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, that's the journey I talk about. That's the ups and downs. That's the grind. But that's who I want to be. That's who I want my program to be. Like, nothing comes easy to us. Like, we don't want anything. We don't expect anything. We're going to work for everything, and that's who we want to be. That's who I am. Elton Hayes, CNHI Pennsylvania. Evan Patrick, you're on deck. Good afternoon, Coach, and uh, congratulations on your opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. 
Coach, um, you are now the uh, fourth African-American head coach in the Big Ten um, of the league at the beginning of this month, had one in Jawan Howard. Uh, there's a lot of conversation going around on just the uh, lack of opportunity for African-Americans and given your position, your stature now, Coach, I'd like to know, um, you know, what, what words of encouragement advice could you give to others who are looking for that opportunity at the Power Five level who happen to look like you? I, I take, um, you know, I kind of, I take a lot of that responsibility on my shoulders. Uh, when I got this job, when it was announced, Juwan Howard was one of the first coaches that reached out to me. And, you know, he and I had a lot of battles, you know, in the NBA with Miami and Boston, um, and we developed a friendship. And then when he came to Michigan, you know, our friendship strengthened. But he reached out to me and said, welcome to the Big Ten. And, you know, I was the second, you know, African-American coach in the league at the time. And now since, there have been two others. Um, I think this is a special time in our, in our profession uh, for people getting opportunities. And I put a lot of that weight on my shoulders because, I, like I told him, I, I probably don't get this opportunity without the, the things that he's doing at Michigan right now, the success that he's had coming in and doing it in a first-class way. Uh, but there's a lot of people before him that are doing the same thing. You know, Mike Boynton at, at Oklahoma State. You know, you think of Leonard Hamilton. Um, just down the line, a lot of coaches, you know, Mike Anderson at St. John's, Patrick Ewing, who was in the NBA at the same time as a coach as myself. And, you know, those are the guys that kind of paved the way for me. Now, it's my responsibility to do right for them. Like, it's my responsibility to do everything I can here to elevate this program, but also provide an opportunity for the next coach to get a chance. And, you know, that's the weight I have on my shoulders, but I take on that responsibility with a lot of pride. And, you know, I want to be, I want to reach out and help as many people as I can, but people don't get an opportunity if I don't do well here. People don't get an opportunity if I don't do right here, if I don't do everything by the book, if I don't have our team prepared to play every single night. And I'm going to do that because that's my standard anyway, but, I'm holding the standard for a lot of other people to really help them get an opportunity. Evan Patrick, Daily Collegian. Adam Bittner, you're on deck. Hey, Micah. You recently spent time as the offensive coordinator and you coached uh, alongside some of the great offensive minds uh, in basketball. How would you describe your offensive philosophies and, and the play style you hope for your defensive teams to have? Your offensive play style. Play style. It, it'll be... Um, you know, similar to how we play in Boston. I, I want to teach our guys, like, how to play basketball. And I started I, – I became a coach. When I was in college, I wanted to be a college basketball coach because I didn't want to teach. You know, so that eliminated high school for me. Now, that's no knock on teachers. I just didn't think I was cut out to teach as uh, the everyday – grind that, that goes into being a teacher, the, um, the, the constant supervision, the constant learning, just everything. And then now, 20 years later, like I am a teacher and that's who I am. That's what I do. I teach this game and I want to teach our guys how to play. So we, we'll do a lot of read and react. We'll do a lot of drilling situations, uh, making, the right play, making the right pass, making the right play. How we want to play it will be a little free-flowing. Um, I'm really big on spacing, giving each other a chance to make plays by getting out of each other's way a little bit, but also putting the onus on those guys to make the right play when it presents itself. But we'll, we'll work on it over and over and over in practice so now the game becomes easy for them. And, you know, with me, everybody needs to touch the ball. Everybody needs to share the ball. The ball needs to move from And if you're doing that offensively, I think guys feel good about that. They feel good about the offense. They feel good about each other making the right plays, which leads to them being more connected on the defensive end. So I know that doesn't explain really a whole lot, but 
you know, I want to hold some stuff back so <laughs> these other Big Ten coaches don't know. They're not worried <laughs> about me, though. I mean, they're, they're, there's a lot of good teams and a lot of great coaches in this league. Adam Bittner, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and then John Petitionock. Hi, Micah. Congratulations. Thank you, Adam. Um, Penn State has not been transparent um, with the public about this coaching transition. Um, by outward appearance, it hasn't been transparent with its own players. How important is transparency for you, um, and how do you plan to rebuild trust inside and outside of this program? Thank you. Good question. Now, it, it um, you know, it, it for me, um, trust is built over time. Like with our players, you know, I, you can't have, you know, when I talked to them for the first time, I didn't expect them to jump through the, the video screen and say, man, this is our coach. We love him. Like, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of conversations. And I want to give them that time. I want to have that time. And that's how you build trust. You build trust by showing people that you care over and over and over again. And then they start to feel like you have their best interests at heart. And that takes time. Um, and we're going to do that. We're going to build trust. We have to build it in our own way. I have to build it in my own way. I have to be genuine each and every time that I meet with these guys. And I don't know a, another way to be. Like what you get from me right now is what you'll get from me on the sidelines, is what you're going to get from me in practice. And I want to be up front with guys, and I want to tell them the truth. And that's how you build that trust. And that's how I'm going to build that trust. I trust uh, our, our administration. And, you know, if I didn't have that trust in them, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, but I trust everything that they tell me. And, you know, I believe in Sandy. I believe in Dr. Barron. I believe in everybody else in this administration. And I have that trust in them. Now I need to relay that trust to our players. And we'll keep making, uh, making this a great situation for everybody. We have time for two more questions. John Petitionock, the Penn State Alumni Association, and then Charles Holman. Hey, Micah. Welcome to Penn State. I appreciate your time today. No problem. I'm happy to be here. Hey, Micah, in your opening statement, you talked about the support system at Penn State with former players, with alumni, with the community. I wanted to ask, how do you plan on building those off the court relationships? And what's the impact and the value when you have a community behind you, when you have an alumni base behind you, and when you have former players behind you and rooting for your success in the program? Uh, that's big for me. I think that's big for us. And like I said, it's not my program. It's their program. And I'm happy to have, like, having Adam Fisher uh, as a Penn Stater, that's important to me. You know, the two guys in the back of the room, Taylor Battle and Nick Colella, those two guys are important to me because they've been here. They've all had success. They can help me transition, but I feel an obligation to, you know, make sure that they're treated the right way. You know, their program is taken care of and in good hands. So... I want to do everything I can to, you know, make everybody proud. You know, every time that our team steps on the court, um, we're trying to make Penn State proud. And when we leave the court, everybody knows what a Penn State team looks like. And that's important to me. That's important to this, you know, the former players, the former coaches, the alumni base. If I'm doing everything I can to make them happy, then I'm doing my job the right way. And last question to Charles Holman, Minnesota Recorder. Congratulations, Coach. My name is Charles Holman, Minnesota Spokesman Recorder. Uh, Mr. Hayes, I just asked you a question about diversity and coaching. And I'd like to add on that, if I may. Uh, three years ago, there was zero black head coaches in the, in the Big Ten. Now there's four. Can you just address or speak on that significance and you being a part of that significance? I, you know, I'm proud. I'm proud to be a part of that significance. And like you said, this is, this is the greatest and most competitive conference in the country. And to be a head coach in this league is an honor. It's an honor for me. But to be an African-American head coach in this league is even more of an honor. You know, 
I get a chance to challenge myself each and every day uh, against great coaches. But, you know, I know that I have the backing and the kind of the support of, of every coach in this league. You know, all of them are great. They've all reached out. They've all said, you know, good things. But, you know, to have, you know, Juwan Howard, to have Mike Woodson, to have Ben Johnson, you know, we're all kind of going through the same thing at the same time. And, you know, we need to continue to elevate this. We need to continue to elevate um, the status of the coaches, not only in this league, but across the country. And like, like I said earlier, we need to, you know, help other people get an opportunity. And, you know, it, it is something that, that weighs on me a lot, but I take great pride in knowing that, you know, I'm going to do it the right way. And I want to be a model for the next guy. You know, whether he's a, a Division One assistant, a Division Two assistant, or he's working in Division Three, or a player somewhere, I want them to have somebody to look up to to say, this is how I can do it. This is where I can aspire to be. And, you know, that's, that's a huge goal for me. Thank you very much, Coach. Welcome to Penn State. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. We'll uh, sign off of the Zoom with the media right now, and then we'll bring up Senior Associate Athletic Director for Advancement, Joe Foley. Thank you. The 14th head coach of Penn State men's basketball officially wrapped up his introductory hey press conference today as he will now meet with NLC members and the donor. Steve, a couple of big takeaways for Coach Shrewsbury. The first one being he mentioned the phrase roll up your sleeves and get the job done the right way a couple of times. Why is that significant? It's significant because this is the program where you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to sit down and you're going to have to go to work right away. His entire career and life has been built on hard work. You don't achieve anything without hard work along the way. You look at how the Celtics play, hard work. You look how Butler got to the Final Four when he was there, hard work. You look at what Purdue's accomplished with him there, hard work. So here's a guy that's going to work hard every day, and he's going to expect that of his team and his players. And that kind of blue-collar mentality wins a lot of games for you and also wins a lot of recruits for you. He also said that he wants to be the underdog team. He wants to keep yep. that consistent trend here at Penn State University. How do you succeed with that mindset? You succeed with that mindset because you go out there with that chip on your shoulder every single time. You can tell during the course of his life and his career that chip has driven him along the way. He needs his players to have that same mentality, and that's why you recruit to that. You recruit the guys saying, okay, we're going to be the underdog every single time out, and even when you're winning, you're still the underdog. Even when you're winning, you look around. Let's take Gonzaga. Gonzaga's going to you know, play for the right to go to the Final Four tonight. they got a chip on their shoulder. You want to know why? Because everybody keeps telling them they can't do it, even at, the, at a team that's on the verge of the Final Four. So that chip can carry you all the way through because it drives you to do that extra rep. It drives you to stay in this gym and shoot extra shots. It drives you as a coach to look at that extra sliver of tape to say, you know what, did I miss something? As he referenced how Brad Stevens said, hey, they did this seven years ago, check this out. That's the kind of mentality that comes to play. But you know something about him today? He remembered every person's name. He, he, he referenced every single coach in the Big Ten. He referenced all the African-American coaches by name. He's sitting up there with no notes, Mitch. Here's a guy that is always, obviously has absorbed a lot, retains a lot, and also wants to relate to people one-to-one. -one. So that's why he was talking to the media. He mentioned them all by name along the way because that's a recognition of a relationship-based person. And a relationship-based person is the kind of person that gets the job done at Penn State. Why is that important, especially as you just alluded to, to get the job done at Penn State? Well, it's important because you know what? Every single day, He's going to go out there and represent Penn State. Every day his record is going to reflect what Penn State is along the way. It's going to take time. It's going to take some patience. But he took this job because he wants to be successful at it. He didn't take this job to sit there and then move on. Hey, I'm going to do this for a couple of years. I'm going to leave. You can tell he's committed to this because along the way he's had enough people say no. This place said yes. And because they said, yes, he's a loyalty-based person, 
And a loyalty-based person feels that, you know what? They said yes to me. I'm going to make a payoff. One quote that Sandy Barber said off the top was sustained success. That was a continuous yeah. phrase that she used. How do you measure that aside from the obvious in championships and titles? Well, okay, so beyond the obvious, sustaining success means obviously sustaining success in the classroom. Graduation rate is going to be important. Players moving on with their lives once they're done here playing basketball at Penn State to feel they got a great education. And whether it's a basketball career or something in business later on life, that's part of sustained success. On the court, as Dick Girardi properly mentioned, Penn State by the metrics has been a top 50 team along the way. Uh, by all the metrics, net, Ken Palm, and so forth. So the last four years, there's been some level of sustained success. Now can he take that and can he now make it 25 and do it on a year and a year out basis? Sure, like every program, there'll be a little dip along the way, but make sure that any valley is a minor one. That way you can quickly climb back up because no matter what, you're not going to have every year be up here at the highest of high. That's what sustained success is, getting to NCAA tournaments. In years you don't make it, maybe it's an NIT here and there. That's a sustained success. One of the greatest quotes from Coach Shrewsbury, I think, during his press conference was, quote, There's no, there, you got to be thankful for the no's in life because it leads you to something great. I thought that was super impactful as he visits with NLC members right now and donors in the background. Why is that phrase important for a guy that comes to a place that hasn't necessarily found sustained success? Well, it's interesting he said that because I know when I talk to my students in my broadcasting class, I said, all you need is one to say yes. But never forget everybody who said no, because they're the ones that missed on the opportunity. And you have an opportunity yourself every single day to prove them wrong while proving the people that said yes right. And to a recruit along the way, they said yes to you. That's really important. And so they're going to be feeling they'll say no. But you said yes to Penn State. You said yes to Micah Shrewsbury. Let's do this together and prove all the people that said no wrong. Speaking of together, he mentioned numerous times the other coaches that have found success and that yeah. he is nowhere near the accolades yeah. that they have accomplished here at Penn State University, but hopes to be in that position one day. 6 o'clock p.m. tonight, join us for our Welcome to Happy Valley Live show as Coach Shrewsbury introduces us to some of those individuals he referenced during his introductory press conference. That'll be live coverage from inside the Bryce Jordan Center. You're going to get a live look like you've never seen before with Coach Shrewsbury and company. Steve, appreciate your time. Great insight from you as Coach Shrewsbury is officially the 14th head coach in Nittany Lion history.